and finite state machine testing. Excellent. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Great, because that's not what I see. So that's good. Someone that you do. Okay, fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I must say, in principle and practice, I'm thoroughly in favour of journal first. I think it's a, an, a really excellent thing to do. Um, so, um, except when people like myself can't actually operate a technology. Uh, full screen rather than slideshow. Okay, great. Um, so, this is, I have just quickly say, I follow this kind of classical structure. So I'm going to a bit about the motivation, the background, and then I will talk about three different uh, subtopics within the paper. Um, I'm not going to go into lots of technical details for any of them. They're, of course, in the paper. Okay. So motivation, finite state machine testing. Um, so there's been lots of work over many, many years, going back to the first paper I'm aware of was um, Moore's paper in 1956. Um, and there are a number of nice features to finite state machine testing. Um, so when we talk about finite state machine, they're mini machines. So every transition has an input output pair and we have an atomicity assumption. So inputs and outputs occur together. Um, they're finite. Uh, we can use lots of results from uh, finite automata theory. And there are some really powerful test generation algorithms and a powerful in a sense of they give guaranteed effectiveness subject to some assumptions. And the classical assumption is we place an upper bound in a number of states of the implementation. We don't know what the implementation is, how it behaves, but we place a bound on it and that allows us to generate test suites with guaranteed effectiveness. So we can formally define them that I said they're essentially finite automata in which uh, transitions have input output pairs, everything's finite, and we have particular properties. Um, so um, if the transition relation defines a total function from states and inputs, then the machine is complete. It means that for every state and every input, it tells you what could happen. And otherwise it's partial. Another impro important property is observability. This simply says that if we have a state, current state, and a particular input output pair happens, then the next state is uniquely defined. So if we think of our mini machines as being finite automata, then this is like saying that the corresponding finite automata is deterministic. This has a nice property because we're typically during testing always reasoning about single states or normally reason about single states rather than sets of states, which has advantages. Uh, we can have nice graphical representations like this one, for example. So here, S0 is meant to represent the initial state. So for example, if the system receives, model receives X1 uh, in the state S0, then either it produces output Y1 and moves to S1, or it produces an output Y2 and moves to S3. So here we have non-determinism. Um, but this is consistent with observability. Can actually see this machine isn't observable. Um, so from S1, input X1, output Y1 could either take us to S0 or to S2. So we do the normal thing in finite state machine testing, which is that we make an assumption about the system on test. So we assume uh, that it's behaves like some unknown finite state machine, N. Then testing is about comparing two finite state machines via observations by running experiments. The semantics is traces only. And if we look, we're only concerned with complete finite state machines, ones where for every state and input the behavior is defined, then there's normally just two forms of correctness, either trace inclusion, which people call reduction as well, or, or trace equivalence. So, and if you look at the literature, there are many, many test generation algorithms, and almost all of them concern complete finite state machines. And 
they then typically either consider just deterministic finite state machines. So every input for every state and input, there's just one transition. Or they consider non-deterministic and they're only interested, they could look at testing for reduction only. So the question is what hat changes when uh, we start generalizing. We start saying we might want to test for something else, or we might want to test uh, from partial machines. There's a, there's a certain amount of literature on this, and there are some interesting results and some really nice papers. Um, this, this paper I'm presenting uh, comes from a sort of longer term background of sitting down and thinking, why don't people do something slightly different? So you get some really quite involved works. Once you drop completeness, uh, for example, then a lot of the techniques become much more involved, much more complicated. And a, a question I, I wondered was, is there something else we can do? Uh, and this paper, in a sense, is a, a, an instance of that. There's a small number of papers. So if we look at reduction, then the standard um, thing to do is, well, we, we're testing for trace inclusion. And if we have non-determinism, we have to be able to observe all the behaviors of the system in response to an input sequence. So we make a fairness assumption. And so this is the uh, this is the classic context for reduction. If we're testing for equivalence, we still need to do this. We still need to check that all behaviors of the system and test are also behaviors of the specification. And again, we're going to need a fairness assumption. So, and from that side, things look very much like reduction. If we, of course, for testing for equivalence, we need to check the other way around this implementation isn't missing any behaviors. How do we do that? Well, we have to be able to observe that some behavior is, isn't present. Um, so there are some trace sigma that's in this language of the specification that's not in the language of the implementation. Now, if we were to consider minimal such traces, they're all the form of a trace that's in the language of both followed by an input-output pair, such that the, if we follow sigma, the initial trace, by input x, then in the specification we can get output y, and in the implementation we can't. And if we want to test for equivalence, then we have to be able to observe this. And of course we can, if we have a fairness assumption. Essentially, we can, at the end of sigma, we apply X and we repeat this process sufficient number of times so that we're happy that uh, we can't observe Y subject to some, maybe some thresholds. If we have to be able to observe this, then the thought is, why don't we represent this in our model? And so what this did, simply did in this paper was to, for each output Y, to add a new symbol that we can think of as an output that corresponds to observing the absence of Y, that Y not being, able, being possible in response to that input. So we enrich our models. So what does this give us? Well, I look at complete finite state machines and then partial. For complete, if we take our finite state machine, we enrich it in this way to give us a new one this finite state machine by doing the obvious thing. Whenever uh, we add a new state, uh, that could be thought of a bit like an error state. And whenever an input-output pair isn't possible, particularly a pair isn't possible from a state S, we add a transition to the error state with the absence of the output. Then we have that two finite state machines are equivalent if and only if, having enriched them in this way, a reduction relation holds. And we know how to test for reduction. We have many, 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 many different test techniques for reduction. So we can take our problem testing for equivalence, for which there is very little work. There are a few techniques. And we can just transform it into this standard problem for which there are many solutions. OK. Um, partial machines change things slightly. So what's the issue with partial? Well, if there's no transition for a given state with a given input, there are several possible explanations. 
Um, so one is anything's allowed, which is fine, but then there's no point testing that because you cannot observe a failure. Another is uh, the system shouldn't, cannot receive that input in that state, in which case, if we have a test case that does that, it doesn't represent possible usage. It's unrealistic. And if we report a failure back to the developer, they can quite happily say, well, that can never happen in practice. It's not a real uh, failure. And the other possibility is the system should never receive that input in that state due to the context or because it causes some damage. So in all these cases, we don't want to apply input X in, in state S. Uh, we can introduce a little bit of notation. We can say about, say, a notation about when it, an input is defined in a state and also what it means for an input to be defined after a trace in the natural way. And then correctness is essentially defined as, for, for equivalence, as something similar to standard equivalence, except we only care about behaviours. Uh, uh, an input following a trace, if that trace is possible in both the specification and the implementation, and the input is defined after the trace sigma in the specification. And in that case, we say, well, it has to be defined in implementation as well, and the possible outputs have to be the same. And we can come up with the corresponding um, implementation of reduction. And the important result is that it's similar to before. So again, if we enrich our models, then we have, right, right before we had um, equivalence turned into reduction. In this case, this notion of correctness called quasi equivalence turns into quasi reduction. Now you could say, well, we don't have much work on testing with quasi reduction, but there is earlier work that shows that testing for quasi reduction can be mapped directly to testing to, for reduction. So again, we've taken our problem, we've mapped it to one of testing for reduction. And so we can use standard techniques. Okay, both those in, in the theorems talks about observable machines. So what happens um, if our finite state machines aren't observable? Well, first thing, for complete machines, we can always transform out. Um, and it's just a standard NFA to DFA transformation. For partial machines, we can't do that. If we do, if we use the, the um, subset construction um, for uh, NFA to DFA construction, then we can add start having um, an input being defined after a trace when the trace can take us to a state in which that input isn't defined. And if we use that for test generation, we can find ourselves applying inputs in states where they're not defined. So that's inappropriate. That doesn't work. Um, what can we do to solve that? Well, one possibility was essentially just to include something like a refusal uh, of an input for wherever it's undefined. This now gives us uh, a complete finite state machine. We stand, apply our standard transformation uh, to make it observable. Um, having done so, Whenever we have a, a, a refusal of an input in a state, we just delete all tra outgoing transitions um, that have that input. Because the refusal in that state says there is some trace. The trace getting to this state can also get to a state in which the input is undefined. And then we can um, transform out the uh, transform to an observable finite state machine. And the important point is that. If we take a specification implementation uh, and the specification is partial and not observable, the implementation is quasi equivalent to the specification if and only if it's quasi equivalent to the version we've created. So we can still use it for testing. Okay, I think I've pretty much ran out of time, but I've also pretty much run out of slides, which is great. Um, so, really, this is show, the work shows how certain. Uh, testing problems for finite state machine testing can be addressed. They're problems that haven't been addressed much in the literature. There are relatively few techniques. And where there are techniques, they tend to be quite involved. Um, and really, it's an instance of a type of solution that um, maybe could be applied more in testing, but would be much more familiar in certain other areas, where essentially we, we take our problem, we transform it into another problem, 
uh, for which we cancel. Um, and that's it. Obviously, proofs and such are in the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, a very clear, very clear talk, very clear presentation. Um, Thank you. We're, we're running nicely on time, so we even have time for, for a question or two, if anybody wants to raise one. I think I'm looking at all the all the chats and I'm not seeing any raised hands or any any questions appearing in the chat at this point. Okay. Let, let me let me just say thank you very much, Rob, for for, for joining this uh, this track. I, I have got I have got a digital cert certificate uh, of attendance, which I would di digitally hand over to you. Um, <laughs> Maybe I should have maybe I should have printed them off and and pushed them into the screen so so everybody can see their certificates. <laughs> but I, it will certainly be emailed to, to you. I don't okay, see a way of attaching it to the chat here. Uh, yeah. So thank That's thanks cool. very much, Rob. No, thank so, you very much again for inviting me and also uh, having a general first track. I said I think it's really good. Cheers.